All right, we'll get started here. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Youth Summit on the Invasive Species Projects and Collaborations. Brought to you by the Invasive Species Centre, the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network, which is coordinated in partnership with the Ontario Invasive Plant Council and the Ontario Woodlot Association and Eastern Ontario Model Forest, and it is funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Invasive Species Centre is located in Sault Ste. Marie, or otherwise known as Bawating, in the Robertson Huron Treaty Territory, and the land where we work is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek and Métis people of Batchewana and Garn River First Nations. As we meet virtually today, our speakers are joining us from all around Ontario, and we acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, and we give thanks for this land, water, and want to express our gratitude to the nations who have been its stewards. Miigwech, thank you. So again, thank you all for joining me today. My name is Darissa Vincentini, the Community Action Leader and Coordinator of the Early Detection and Rapid Response Network at the Invasive Species Centre, and I'll be your host and your moderator. Just a couple of housekeeping items. You may notice that when you join the event that you are brought to a lobby where you can actually engage with other attendees and speakers by typing into the chat box. Once you have joined a session, your microphone and your camera uh, have been automatically turned off and um, they'll continue to do that every time you're in a session. If you want to follow along with our agenda, you can find a PDF version in the description of the registration page. And uh, we'll start with the welcoming remarks, hearing from myself, the Honorable Steve Clark, Barb Tobin, a OTF volunteer, and from each of the organizations that collaborate to run the program that brought us here today. After that, we'll hear from our first two speakers in the morning session at 1045, followed by an hour lunch from noon till one, and we'll resume with our afternoon speaker session at 1 p.m. and wrap up around 3.30 this afternoon. Each speaker will be given 25 minutes to present and followed by a five minute question period. And then at the end of each speaker session, we've allotted some time to address additional questions that we may have missed. Uh, to ask those burning questions, you can do one of two things. You can type them into the question and answer box anytime throughout the presentations. Or if you'd prefer, you can raise your hand using the react button on your screen, which will request the host to unmute your mic so that you can verbally ask your questions. Uh, so without further ado, we'll get started. Before we jump into things, let's make sure we're all on the same page of what an invasive species is. An invasive species is an organism that is introduced outside of its native range and causes harm within its newly introduced range. A non-native species is not inherently considered invasive. It has to negatively impact the ecology, the economy, or society in its introduced range to be considered invasive. And typically it affects, uh, invasive species affect all three. Uh, some characteristics of an invasive species after they are introduced include being fast growing and reproducing very quickly, making them very prolific and opportunistic. Uh, they also often lack natural predators that would normally slow their spread and keep their population in check. And the target species that they attack or compete with often lack natural defenses against the invader from not having co-evolved together. All of these characteristics contribute to the exponential population growth of invasive species and the severity of their impacts. Increased travel and trade have been the catalyst for spread of invasive species across the world. This can sometimes be from intentionally importing a species like a plant due to its aesthetics or medicinal properties or unknowingly, like the case with a lot of aquatic invasives that can hitch rides in the ballast waters of shipping freights. Because of hum these human channeled pathways, the number of introductions of invasive species continues to increase both intercontinentally, as well as within continental, national and provincial boundaries. One way that we tackle invasive species is through the power of community science. Community science is important to increase in education and outreach to further the collective understanding of invasive species and their pathways of spread. It provides collaboration between the public and the scientific community, and it's an extremely cost-effective way to collect important data and gain access to new areas. It also increases the eyes on the ground, contributing to, contributing to important research and monitoring. 
the more eyes on the ground, the more likely we are to spot those first detections of a new introduction or a species that's expanding its range. The Early Detection and Rapid Response Network Ontario is our community science program. The EDR network is a community action network aimed to train citizens on how to detect, report, and respond to invasive species in Ontario. It's an eyes on the ground approach to stopping new introductions or preventing further spread of invasive species. We achieve this by providing the tools, training, and resources through education and outreach so everyone can help play a part. The EDRR network helps fill in invasive species knowledge and tool gaps and inform communities of incoming threats. Uh, we help coordinate stewardship removals with local organizations and volunteers. We link partners with invasive species resources and volunteers or other needs. We also provide opportunities to work with wide range of organizations on various areas and projects. Uh, and then lastly, we also respond to public in inquiries. This graph depicts the invasion curve of an invasive species, and the EDRR network focuses its efforts on, at or before species arrival. That could be a local arrival within your community or all the way up to a high level threat uh, to Canada. Prevention and early detection are key in mitigating the cost and the time required to manage a species. It also increases the feasibility of a species being successfully managed the earlier that it is detected. The earlier we can detect a potential inv invasive species through the power of community science and the community awareness, the quicker we can act and react to eradicate the species before it has a large impact uh, on human health, biodiversity, economy, and society. Once a species is established, however, the strategy often shifts from eradication to management and containment, since eradication becomes less feasible. The EDRR network is coordinated by the Invasive Species Centre and delivered in partnership with the Ontario Invasive Plant Council and the Ontario Woodlot Association, Eastern Ontario Model Forest. And we have been the proud recipients of the Ontario Trillium Foundation Grow Grant from April 2020 to March 2022. This funding was received to encourage people to support a healthy and sustainable environment and to protect and restore uh, Ontario ecosystems by training community members to prevent, detect, and manage invasive species in their community. We would like to acknowledge the contributions from the Ontario Trillium Foundation that make events such as today's Youth Summit, as well as other uh, EDRR projects possible. The Ontario Trillium Foundation is an agency of the Government of Ontario that has been investing in community initiatives for more than 30 years and is Canada's largest granting foundation. They provide on ongoing support for nonprofits in Ontario that create positive change within their communities and their investments help to improve the health and well-being of Ontarians. Previously, our EDRR efforts were focused in parts of on Northern Ontario. However, through the OTF's Grow Grant investment, we have successfully ex expanded the EDRR network and outreach efforts into Eastern Ontario and continue to spread knowledge on the impacts of invasive species. Since April 2020, and despite challenges of the ongoing pandemic, we have engaged with over 3,800 people through initiatives aimed at increasing the number of participants in ecosystem conservation and restoration efforts related to invasive species. We have also sur surpassed our goal of having 800 people actively managing and monitoring for the invasive species within the Kingston, Rideau, and Quinty catchment of Eastern Ontario. With more, more than 3,800 people now aware of the potential threats of invasive species and over 800 people actively managing and monitoring for them, we thank the Ontario Trillium Foundation for their continued support of the EDRR network and for the success of our community science outreach initiatives. If you'd like to learn more about OTF and the work that they do, visit their website at www.otf.ca. Uh, so next I'm happy to invite Barbara Tobin, an Ontario Trillium Foundation representative to say a few words. Barbara, the floor is yours. Barbara, you'll have to unmute your mic first, sorry. Let's start that again. Hello, there you everyone. go. <laughs> 
I hope that your families are staying safe and healthy during these unprecedented times. My name is Barb Tobin and I'm an Ontario Trillium Foundation volunteer. I'm honoured to attend your virtual youth summit and OTF recognition event today and learn more about the impact on your GROW grant in your community. The Ontario Trillium Foundation recognizes the long history of the Indigenous people in Ontario. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we are gathered is traditional territory of the Akdashabi, specifically in Garden River and Batuana First Nations, as well as Métis people. This territory, as mentioned before, is governed by the Robertson-Huron Treaty. OTF is an agency of the Government of Ontario and one of Canada's leading grant-making foundations. And thanks to the funding we received from the Ontario government, we're able to award nearly 650 grants over the past year to nonprofit organizations across the province. Your organization recently received a $258,500 grant over 24 months to cover staffing and program costs to protect ecosystems from invasive species in Eastern Ontario. Your initiative helped people participate in eco conservation and restoration efforts and had an impact in the community and your organization encourages people to support a healthy and sustainable environment. Thank you for inviting me to your event. I look forward to sharing your story with my fellow OTF volunteers. And finally, thank you for the work you're doing every day for contributing to build a vibrant and healthier Ontario. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Barb. Next, I would like to introduce Sarah Rang, the Executive Director of the Invasive Species Centre to talk about what we do at the ISC. Hi, Sarah. Thanks, Teresa. And uh, thank you all panelists for, for joining us today and, and uh, for you and your office or, or your home setting as well. Uh, my name is Sarah Rang and I'm honored to be the Executive Director at the Invasive Species Centre. Um, so I'll just spend a few minutes introducing you to the Invasive Species Centre and, and some of the work that we do and happy to answer any questions uh, later in the afternoon. Uh, just one second, I'm hoping that you can uh, uh, see my screen okay. I'll just turn into presentation mode and then um, we'll get started. Uh, does it look okay to you, Darissa? Just checking in? Yep, okay. Um, the Invasive Species Center uh, is located in Sault Ste. Marie. We've been around for about a decade. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization and our mission really is to help prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species. And we always look at it through the three lenses of environment, economy, and uh, society as well. Um, so if you're ever in Sault Ste. Marie, um, in a non-COVID situation, we very much welcome you to join us at the Invasive Species Centre. Um, know that you have a standing invitation. Um, at the Invasive Species Centre, we really work in three main baskets, um, and we work to increase and diversify investment in invasive species. Uh, we work to catalyze action and also to share knowledge. And I'll just take you through a couple of example projects in each one of those areas. Um, so we work a lot uh, in terms of uh, what we call priority species, and this can be in the forest, uh, in the aquatics, um, and also uh, in the plants. And we also work on pathways, uh, the, the how invasive species uh, reach us. So it could be through firewood or through our watercraft or through trade. Um, we spend, uh, we try and share knowledge on invasive species. Many people are, are unfamiliar with invasive species and the importance that they um, are in our backyard and our communities and our forests. Um, so we do a variety of different outreach uh, in terms of webinars and uh, events as well, such as this today. And we also um, are believers in terms of building the uh, business case for investment in invasive species. And we do that by trying to quantify the costs and benefits of um, control and prevention of invasives and presenting a business case for investment. 
Uh, we're very proud to partner with a number of different organizations uh, on the Asian Carp Canada program. Um, so this is part of our aquatic uh, program uh, where we're trying to draw attention to uh, the issue of Asian Carp, which are knocking on the door of the Great Lakes. Uh, fortunately, not yet in the Great Lakes, um, but have been projected and modeled to have a, a very large impact in um, all those three areas that we were talking about, the economy, uh, our environment, and also our society. Um, so we try to spread the word uh, through some of the mechanisms that you're seeing today on, on your slide here, using sort of influencer marketing and social media tactics, as well as um, events at the Toronto Zoo and a, a webinar series. Uh, we work a lot with different municipalities, um, believing that a lot of invasive species uh, work is done at the municipal level. Um, so we've created a community of practice by which municipalities can sort of share notes and talk to each other about what's worked in one municipality and how it could be of use in another municipality. Um, so it's a way of kind of spreading knowledge uh, through those municipal um, practical uh, workers who are, are doing the lion's share of, of control of invasive species. Um, we are also very proud to be working on a national invasive species expenditure survey. And this is building on work that we did at the provincial level. Um, trying to sort of document and find out exactly where we're at in terms of uh, municipal expenditures on invasive species. Um, and when we did it in Ontario, for example, we found that the majority of, of uh, local governments were spending money uh, in the control and management, much less money being spent in terms of prevention or detection. Um, and that's understandable. That's where, you know, the public demand is for action. Uh, but we're also very interested in trying to invest in sort of the prevention and detection, uh, which is part of the early detection and rapid response uh, network. That's why we're big believers in, in why that's so important. It's the most cost effective way to control invasives. Uh, we've worked, um, as Doris has mentioned, in terms of citizen science and monitoring. Um, we're very pleased to work in terms of the LDD uh, tree sampling. Um, and uh, uh, trying to scrape the LDD off, which has uh, proven to be tremendously popular and people want practical things uh, to do in their own backyard or on their own favorite tree. And we're working um, also with the province in terms of sampling for zebra mussels and uh, spiny water flea, which are two um, things that can totally change our, our lovely lakes. Um, through our iSample Ontario program, where we're encouraging volunteers to actually sample in different ways. Um, we're also very proud to be doing micro grants, um, trying to reward those volunteer local uh, groups who are doing wonderful things on the ground uh, by giving them a small, uh, modest amount uh, to actually support them and do efforts on invasive species. Um, we're investing in training and particularly in terms of the forest uh, pest training area. Um, trying to provide practical tools uh, for new and uh, detecting new invasive species, such as hemlock woolly adelgid, which is um, a new invasive species that attacks hemlock trees and has just been found in the Niagara region. Um, so there's some practical uh, uh, things that people can do to try and assess whether or not they have this particular uh, forest pest in, on their hemlock trees. Um, we're building a relationship with Indigenous communities, um, and we're trying to work closely with the ones that are in the Sault Ste. Marie area, so Garden River and Batchewana. And we're also working more broadly with Anishinaabek Nation, which is uh, 39 different communities around Ontario. Um, our goal is to build towards uh, supporting Indigenous communities as they develop their invasive species management program. Um, and uh, have that fit within their lands, lands development program as well. Um, so we've started with a, a, a micro grant program to um, help the communities that are actually already working in this area. Uh, we uh, were fortunate, um, thanks to many of our colleagues, to have diagnostic services at uh, in Sault Ste. Marie area. So we're able to provide uh, zooplankton diagnostics um, for not only the province, but for uh, other groups as well. And uh, we have a deep insect uh, diagnostic uh, lab as well. So we're very involved in uh, trying to uh, do the basics in terms of identifying what insects are there in our kind. 
Um, we have a, a free webinar series, so if that's of interest, uh, please sign up. It happens every month and we focus on different uh, topics. Uh, it's also available on YouTube, um, so if there's a particular issue that's of interest to you, please check out our YouTube channel and, and uh, in an hour you can uh, learn an awful lot from our partners in terms of a particular area. Uh, we're very proud to be working uh, collaboratively on a green shovels project uh, and this is a collaborative effort of many different organizations and we're working uh, in terms of trying to improve Phragmites uh, coordination and implementation in Ontario and also working on innovative new tools um, and there's some really cool new tools coming up in either from eDNA or uh, using drones to actually map and monitor invasives that uh, we're working together to try, try and learn and, and advance. Uh, we're proud to be um, sponsoring an international conference in association with uh, the governments of uh, Netherlands and Belgium um, in April. Um, please, it's a virtual uh, and an in-person event, so please uh, consider attending uh, virtually if that fits with uh, your calendar and schedule. It's in April, um, and we will be taking a look at some of the lessons that we've learned from Europe and how can we actually apply them uh, here in Ontario and Canada and North America. So uh, it's an interesting kind of global look at invasive species. Uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with us um, and you know stay in touch with us if you would like to uh, through our quarterly newsletter. Uh, we do a bi-weekly media scan with everything that's new on invasives and also hold events and webinars. So. Uh, very much interested in hearing from you and supporting you in, in terms of your knowledge uh, and questions about invasives. Um, I know many on the line are, are sort of young professionals and uh, very much encourage you to uh, pursue a career in biology or environment or invasive species management. Um, I know it's hard uh, it, when you're in school to imagine uh, what you can become, um, and it's not always the most obvious career pathway. Uh, but I would encourage you to keep the faith, and if you're enjoying um, your look in biology and nature, uh, there, I'm here to give you the good news that there is potential to uh, have gainful employment in, in invasive species management and also environmental management in general. So uh, we do hire uh, from time to time at the Invasive Species Center and we always post it on our careers page. So uh, please sign up for that if you'd like to be notified of any job openings. Uh, we do hire interns regularly um, and they stay with us for about a year. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, please just watch our career page. But um, just wanted to give you some words of encouragement that, um, you know, if you're in this field and watching today and wondering, you know, is this going to be for me? I would uh, encourage you to uh, keep, keep at it and please don't hesitate to uh, contact us if you have any questions. Um, that's it for me. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, Darissa, but uh, please, uh, the door's open. Um, we're always open for new partnerships and for, for new ideas. So don't hesitate to contact any member of the ISC team and my contacts are here as well. Um, so uh, turning it over back to you, Darissa. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I went to school for biology and never thought I'd work in invasive species or never knew that it was an area of focus I could be in. So uh, it's definitely rewarding and I definitely recommend it. So thanks again for that, Sarah. Uh, next, I'm going to be introducing Belinda Junkin, the in executive director of one of our partnering organizations, the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. So Belinda, you can go ahead and share your screen. And you'll have to unmute, unmute. your, there you go. <laughs> Before I get started. I think somebody <laughs> said that was the new uh, phrase for uh, the COVID. That's uh, everything is unmute, unmute. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, and it's not gonna let me do that till I do this share screen. And I'm gonna put you here. I have multiple screens going, so sorry. It just takes me a second and share Oops, there it wants to be. sorry each of these programs is a little bit different okay can you see my screen Darissa? we're good to go thank you 
Everyone can hear me okay? Another thumbs up. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks, Darissa, for that uh, lovely welcome. And thank you to you, EDRR, and our uh, sponsor, Ontario Trillium Foundation, um, for allowing us to host this event. And for you, Darissa, for organizing the event today. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to um, introduce myself. I'm Belinda Junkin. I'm the Executive Director of the Invasive Plant Council. Um, the OIPC is a not-for-profit organization, and we work in partnership with professionals and community members throughout the province. Our mandate is to serve as a forum for collaborative and coordinated action towards invasive plants. We do this through education, networking, development and knowledge sharing, and we support on the ground initiatives to prevent and detect and manage invasive plants throughout the province. We're founded in 2007 by a group of passionate individuals who saw a need for a coordinated provincial um, response. We provide leadership and expertise by maintaining our an extensive network of invasive plant managers and experts, including all levels of government, non-government, municipalities, conservation authorities, indigenous groups, industries such as landscape, nursery, retailers, and academics. We also provide an expert for, uh, we also provide expert information on how to manage invasive plants through our library of resources, such as our best management practices and more that I'll talk about later. We conduct outreach initiatives through webinars and workshops, and I'll also address some more about that later. All of this information is available on our website. The OIPC envisions an environment within Ontario where the economy and society is perfect, protected from the adverse impacts of invasive plants. Um, Ontario Invasive Plant Council, or OIPC for short, represents Ontario on the board of the Canadian Council on Invasive Species which provides a national voice for the fight against invasives. We work together to build practical solutions to prevent the spread of invasive species and work on programs such as Don't Let It Loose, Buy Local, Burn Local, and we work together to share information throughout the country. Our board of directors is, uh, represents representatives from federal, provincial, government agencies, municipalities, conservation authorities, um, across the gamut, as well as individuals. We currently have two active committees, our Horticulture Outreach Collaborative Committee and the Ontario Phragmites Group. Um, HOC wants to promote the horticulture outreach, wants to promote um, uh, the planting and use of native and uh, the eradication of invasive plants. One of our very familiar uh, programs, or some of you may have um, seen, is our Grow Me Instead program, which includes a guide that's our most sought out resource and was created by this committee. It was created to assist gardeners in making informed decisions about the plants they're buying and helping to educate and avoid, avoid the use of invasive plants. It provides a lot of information about garden plants and, and specific alternatives. Um, the guide, there is a Northern Ontario guide and a Southern Ontario guide, and this guide is available uh, to download for free off the OIPC website. Our second active committee is the Ontario Phragmites Working Group, and uh, their um, mission and mandate is to prevent the spread of Phragmites and to help um, manage eradicate it. Um, over the past year, we've created an update on our best management practices guide on Phragmites. It's now almost a 70 page document, and that includes species at risk that one must look at out for when managing or um, uh, controlling uh, Phragmites. This group um, also provides a, a collaborative um, center, a network of projects within the province whereby groups are working actively to um, remove Frag. And this group will meet on January 18th, 2022 
And um, there'll be more information on this upcoming meeting on our website. It's a full day of Fraggers getting together to talk about um, Fragmites, uh, Fragmites management, and the latest scientific research on it. We have a rich library of resources, all available on our website for free. We have a variety of guides um, from everyone from professionals to public. Our clean equipment protocol helps to provide guidelines for preventing the spread of invasive plants by cleaning your equipment and gear before moving between sites and is used by uh, many of the professionals and um, uh, ministry departments within the province. Working with the City of London, we've developed a municipal strategy framework guide, which is now used um, to assist other municipalities in creating their own uh, municipal strategy for the management of invasive plants. We've also supported and assisted other municipalities in creating their municipal strategies, as well as hosting workshops for municipal staff and consultants. We've recently just completed a four series uh, webinar, um, four series training session um, uh, for a municipality to train their staff to make them aware of invasive plants. And we were able to educate over 120 people over four days. So we create customized training as well. OIPC promotes the use of um, this coordinated planned invasive plant strategy versus just one off. And it considers human health, biodiversity, species at risk, economical and social impacts. And um, we look forward to doing more work in this area. We also have several quick reference guides, including both for terrestrial and aquatic plants, and they highlight the plant identification features and control practices. OIPC is best known for our scientific documents, our best management practices, guides, and technical bulletins. These documents are used by professionals and provide a comprehensive review of the plant, its life cycle, the latest information on control methods. In a BMP, you will find anything and everything you wanted to know about flowering rush or Nor Norway maple. We have over 23 of these BMPs published today and we're working on four more at this time. They are available for free um, on our website. We rely on a large network of experts to assist us in the development of these documents. As well, we often place a call out um, to all of our contacts seeking photos or recent control practices. To learn more about this or to get involved, I su suggest that you hit subscribe in our website and add your name to our mailing list and you'll be able to contribute to the development of these documents in the future. We offer training programs such as um, last year we had garlic mustard and Phragmites, and we'll be uh, ramping those up again this year. It's an opportunity for you to learn and interact with professionals and an opportunity to network with our unique event software. So you get to sit down at a table, um, and I, I can think specifically of a table I sat at last year online with this group, and we had everything from a, a new professional to very seasoned practitioners. Um, and they were discussing what works, what doesn't work, um, career paths, all those things. So it's much more than just the uh, plant that's discussed. We're pleased to be a partner with the EDRR project. It aligns with our mandate of education. And um, this uh, is a collaborative approach and focuses on bringing together key partners. And this year, we're on this term, we were glad, pleased to um, include the Eastern Ontario Model Forest um, Group. The original network, as Darissa said earlier, the original mandate was to create a spotters network in Ontario and to harness this effort um, to empower local citizens, conservation groups, and others to work together to identify, track, and control. So OIPC has been a founder since this was started in 2014, along with ISC. Um, our first uh, pilots were in um, 
southern Ontario, we then expanded into the north, and in this term we've moved into eastern Ontario. So within this project, the EDRR, OIPC is su successfully delivered, including two um, very successful workshops. Our intro to invasive plants was attended by 185 people. Wow, that's the most people we've ever had attend an invasive plant workshop. So great job, everyone, um, for getting the attendance and the atten attack attention and attract so many people. We also did uh, Himalayan balsam with over 75 attendees. We also created two new technical documents. Um, again, these are a short summary of the plant and management strategies, herbicide application guidelines, if they're applicable, disposal, rehabilitation, and monitoring. These are three to four page documents used by professional, professionals to assist in invasive plant management. These are small, short summary documents um, versus our best management practices guides that can be 60 to 70 pages in length. So this is the, the quick version. Um, so what can you do? Um, how can you engage? Uh, you can visit the OIPC website, familiarize our, yourself with our resources. It's a, a very rich library. Um, to help you with any of your projects or interests. Subscribe to the OIPC mailing list. Um, and again, we use this list to reach out when we're seeking input. If you have a picture, who knows, um, some little piece of information that you have may be extremely relevant and valuable. So share it with us. Join our committees. Um, and I'm going to say beyond join our committees, um, Join community groups, um, volunteer. Um, everybody needs assistance and everybody's looking. It's a chance to learn, engage, and meet professionals. Become a member of OIPC. We have a reduced rate for students. Um, I think it's like $20 a year. It provides discounted attendance at our conferences and training opportunities. And attend our upcoming events. Um, we have an OIPC annual conference, which is taking place on January 13th. Um, the Ontario Phragmites Working Co Group Conference is January 18th. These are opportunities to learn and network. So like Sarah, I, I sat and thought about the people who would be attending today, and I thought, um, how can I encourage you on this interest and on this career path? And um, I think something that um, uh, if invasive species or uh, biology, if these are your passions, there's many ways to help and many different career path opportunities um, that lay ahead for you. All of us presenting here today have people who are science-based experts. That's one area of the field. But we also need people with accounting, marketing, social media, education, uh, training, project management, and association management tools too. So there's many opportunities available to you. So that uh, general business knowledge along with your science could be a value or your science or your business along with an interest in science. So that can um, broaden the field much greater. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions, um, if you'd like uh, to discuss anything that I've talked about here today, and I hope to see you at some of our upcoming events. And with that, Teresa, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Belinda. And that's such a great point that you don't have to have a science background to get into invasive species. Just an interest is enough and having some transferable skills that will help you apply it to the field is all you need. So thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have John Pino, the Executive Director of the Ontario Woodlot Association, one of our other partnering organizations. So I will pass it on to you, John, and you can share your screen and unmute your mic. Thank you. How's that, Dorissa? Can you hear me, see me, and see my screen? 
everything's excellent. Okay, perfect. Thanks. I'll just start by by thanking uh, folks at the Invasive Species Center and the other partners in this for the opportunity to to make a presentation. I'm wearing two hats these days, both as the executive director of the Ontario Woodlot Association and Eastern Ontario Model Forest, which we're in the process of, of merging with over the next oh, six to eight, 10 months. We'll see how, how that process goes. But uh, we're very happy partners in this. And uh, it's, it's one of the, the, the great benefits of merging with the Model Forest that we become more engaged at the Ontario Woodlot Association and uh, are, are reaping the benefits of, of all the good work. So I'll just uh, give you a little bit of a summary on, on what we're all about. We're, we're roughly 2,200 members, I think now, but, but growing rapidly. And uh, we reach probably close to four to 5,000 private forest owners in the province through, through our various uh, media and, and communications initiatives. Uh, we publish quarterly the Ontario Woodlander, which we're very proud of, monthly newsletter, We've got a new website, which, which was just uh, unveiled last week, very modern and, and up to date. And our e-commerce and database has, has gone very modern as well. Uh, we're on all the major social media platforms and, and our following is growing rapidly. Uh, we do a virtual conference in AGM late April of this year. We're hoping to go back to live and in person. Uh, it's an annual sort of thing usually get a few hundred folks out of our members and uh, we're organized in 20 chapters across the province. Uh, probably 100 events annually, woodland walk and talks, presentations, seminars, workshops, courses, and a lot of them on invasive species and, and what's going on there, keeping people up to date. Um, certainly the webinars the last couple of years have been, have been particularly strong in that theme and uh, really reached a lot of folks so, again as a result of our partnership with uh, EDRR. Yeah, I got the acronym right and the Invasive Species Center in the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. We do a number of other things with Lands Appreciation Week. Uh, we've got a morning of great products. Uh, we've, we've got a new forest owners forum or blog on our website. And again, that merger with the Eastern Ontario Model Forest is just really enhancing the whole value proposition of the two organizations and the legacy will be strong and, and protected. And we do a fair amount of advocacy on behalf of private forest owners, woodlot owners, when, when the need arises or we wanna be proactive. So that's really what we're all about. We're about value for our members and speaking out on their behalf and uh, certainly partnering with anyone we can that can, can help us do what we want to do and, and like-minded and, uh, and and gives us uh, a voice and and gets the information flowing both ways. We got a few special projects ongoing now and very proud of them. Um, a lot of them really fit well with the, uh, the provincial government's four sector strategy, good stewardship, sustainability, using more wood as long as it's sustainable and with best, best practices. Uh, making sure we're competitive, we want innovation, we want to create markets, and we want lots of forest-related employment. And just to echo what I heard, there are so many opportunities in the forest sector, and very broad, very, very different um, in, in terms of what they focus on. And, and I could go on and on about this. I'm a part-time professor in the forest tech program at Algonquin College, and I just see uh, our, our good graduates being gobbled up and doing all kinds of great jobs that, that they probably never anticipated. And certainly some of them have again to do with invasive species or into that, you know, that sort of general uh, theme of work in that context. So great, great to see happening. But uh, I'll just talk a little bit about these projects. The uh, Community Forest Owners Cooperative Pilots, we just started these about a year, year and a half ago. And it, it's basically a way of creating a situation where landowners with with kind of fragmented and orphan plantations that are 30, 40, 50 years old can come together in a region within a vicinity of each other and, and kind of pool their needs and, and, uh, and what needs to be done to, uh, to get some harvesting done, some thinning that, that improves the health of their forests, that, that basically improves the vigor and, and wildlife biodiversity and everything, but at the same time gets them a little bit of revenue and money from from the harvested wood, whatever it can be used for. And we find that a lot. We're great at tree planting, 
but the follow up is poor and and we've got to get better at that so that, you know after a time you thin out plantations like that where where you know hundreds of thousands of trees have been planted and make sure you know native tolerant hardwoods and other species can naturally regenerate underneath and, and you get the kind of forest you originally you know wanted to have happen when when you planted but kind of forgot and there's all kinds of reasons that, that those sorts of things are forgotten what we find happens here too though is that very often invasive species has become an issue with with some of these participants in our cooperatives and several of our properties as we got this going had to be sprayed for dog straggling vine and it was it was very successful and we got rid of it and now they can continue on and, and make sure that when they do the thinning the natural regeneration occurs so we're always on the lookout for that and our forest service providers give really good prescriptions to make good things happen we got an economic uh, in inventory and economics project going on in eastern ontario in the united counties of prescott and russell but the idea is we're, we're using this lidar which is, is laser-based uh, data collection it's a remote sensing technology that gives you kind of a 3d point cloud where you're able to really you know kind of analyze and model and determine what the structure of the forest is and, and know a lot of the attributes so that you can do good planning and and uh, and good management in the long term if you've got that inventory that's been derived from the lidar and then we're modeling to see how good practices or best management practices can allow folks to to improve again their their uh, their health and vigor of their privately owned forest uh, again the biodiversity wildlife but at the same time you know give them a sustainable source of revenue if it's done well done right over time and uh we we feel that we can do a lot more of this across ontario and, and my kind of dream and goal before i retire is to to see private land forest inventory everywhere and um, woodlots being being uh, managed and and the practices being modeled based on that good inventory so open for that and we'll take it again uh, to a, to a larger extent across the province it's up to uh, it's up to us to find the funding to make it happen but basically we're looking at a five to ten year project and there's a lot of interest and support and it's a matter of leveraging but we could have you know that private land inventory everywhere if, if things go well in the next five ten years we, we feel that you know in our organization we don't have an awards program uh, or recognition program so we've, we've started one or we're, we're about to start one where we recognize landowners that are doing things right and uh, you know there's a lot of them out there and, and we we basically want to recognize um, several or more more than we uh, we have in the past, which is none at our annual general meeting and, and tie it into to making sure they're into the managed forest tax incentive program or FSC certification, which I'll talk about in a minute. But they're, they're implementing best practices, they're managing their, their woodlots for the long term and for all the values, the, the multitude of values, not just, you know, fiber, um, fiber extraction, but, you know, again, all of those uh, wildlife and, and, and natural ecosystem, ecosystem process based uh, important factors. And, and we're making some progress there and, and getting that recognition program going. And uh, certainly there are a long, there's a long queue of people that would be deserving of that in our membership. And our communications coordinator has been working on these instructional videos and there's a great city series we've established as a woodland walk and talk monthly video of, of one of our members just walking around their woodlot talking about what they're doing and and uh, how they're managing things and and the problems they're having the issues sometimes it's invasive certainly buckthorn has been brought up more than once and uh and the uh, ldd moth and uh it, it's just a great opportunity for our members to see what's going on on their fellow members woodlots and, and get an idea we're also looking at uh, priority videos, you know, plantation thinnings, obviously with our cooperatives, uh, managing more as a farm business, managing for invasive species, all those sorts of things, improving your stand. Climate change and, and carbon sequestration, dealing with that, you know, making our woodlots more resilient. Uh, it's, it's all part and parcel of what we want to do with these helpful instructional videos. And we produced a number, we've got our own YouTube channel as part of our suite. Of, uh, of social media and it seems to be really catching on and members are going in there by the hundreds and I'd like to see them going in there by the thousands soon and I think we will. 
And it's a little bit more on the, uh, the merger with the Eastern Ontario model forest. And uh, I, I'm just really excited about the opportunities that it's creating and, and what, what it's already done for us. Um, again, there's just a, a great legacy and enhanced value proposition with the, the Eastern Ontario model forest and the Ontario Woodlot Association joining as one organization. Um, what's really been great for me and very, very tangible is the Forest Health Network, and it's managed by Jim McCready, who I think is out there on, on our behalf, and it involves the Invasive Species Center and Invasive Plant Council, and of course funded by the, the, the Trillium Foundation, the EDRR, and everything we've been doing with, with uh, this project and the Forest Health Network's a part of that. Um, it, it's been great. It, it allows our members, again, I think I, I've said it earlier, to, to both get lots more information through our various media, especially webinars and that, but also in our magazine or in our e-newsletter, get that information that they need on invasive species, but also act as citizen scientists say and, and, and give back reports and, and data that, that's very helpful to, uh, to all of us who are working uh, you know, more directly with invasive species and wanna know what's going on. So it's been a, a great, great partnership in that respect and we really appreciate that. Uh, we've, we've inherited the FSC program, which has been been really good, and that involves carbon credits and offsets, and, and there's a program that's growing there, and, and we're making that, uh, we're hoping to make that more uh, more pervasive and stronger and, and uh, widespread across the province and grow it. Uh, all kinds of events, education, strong strong connection with Indigenous folks and First Nations, with the Eastern Ontario Model Forest, that's really helping the Ontario Woodlot Association. Um, there's a lot of overlap already. I mean, a lot of, a lot of EOMF, Eastern Ontario Law Force members are also Woodlot Association members. So, uh, there's, there's just great goodwill in making the whole thing happen. And we're hoping that happens by March 31st, 2022. And it's occupying a lot of my time, but that's about it. Um, again, thanks for the opportunity to speak and, and, uh, and to, to take part in the session and I'll turn it back over to you, Drissa. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. And it's really exciting for you over there with the merge between Ontario Woodlot Association and the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. Like you said, I think that it's a great fit. Sure. Um, so now I think I'm going to try and go back and play the recorded remarks from the Honorable Steve Clark. Hopefully it works this time. And let me just get everything going here. All right, hopefully you can see my screen and hopefully you'll be able to hear the video. <laughs> Hello everyone. Hunter will show you groundbreaking work being done oh. on invasive species with you today. Yeah. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. First, I, I want to thank the Invasive Species Center for organizing this important summit to engage young people like yourselves. Additionally, I also want to thank you for being here today and for your interest in invasive species, which pose a significant threat to this province, especially to our communities right across eastern Ontario. Our province is now home to a variety of invasive species. There are plants like garlic mustard, dog strangling vine and wild parsnips that strangle native species in our backyards. And there are insects like the Lamentria dispar dispar moth and the emerald ash borer that damage our trees. In Kempville, for example, the LDD moth impacted thousands of hectares of trees this year, including oak, birch, maple and conifers. Sadly, it's estimated that every year, invasive species cause over $3 billion in damage to Ontario's forestry, agriculture, tourism, and recreation sectors. Our government is committed to use every resource at our disposal to help all of our partners do everything they can to address this issue. That's why I'm pleased through our government to announce that the Ontario Trillium Foundation is supporting the Invasive Species Centre in its ongoing fight against invasive species in Eastern Ontario. We're investing more than 250,000 over two years to help the center team up with local organizations, clubs and businesses in the Quinney, Kingston and Rideau area. Additionally, this year, we invested over $2 million in invasive species education and research. 
Our government also recently developed new rules to address 13 invasive species and water vessels that usually carry them into Ontario and distribute them around our province. We will continue to ensure our partners have the resources and supports they need to fight these invasive species. And that includes our municipal partners who are on the front lines of the fight. Municipalities use up a lot of their resources to control these species. In fact, a 2019 survey by the Centre revealed that municipalities spent over $50 million per year responding to invasive species issues. They're doing tremendous work, but we need more eyes on the ground to help us locate and monitor these pests. Through this summit today, the Centre will show you groundbreaking work being done on invasive species research and resource management and introduce you to the experts doing it so that you can get involved in the fight and make a real impactful difference. I'd like to conclude by commending the Invasive Species Centre for the work they are doing to fight these environmental threats. This summit is an excellent opportunity for those in attendance to learn about emerging invasive species issues, fields of research and potential career opportunities. I hope you have an informative and productive summit. Thank you so much. All right, great remarks by the Honorable Steve Clark, the MPP from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. All right, so with that, we conclude the opening remarks and it is 1035, so we'll take a quick 10 minute break. You can refill your coffee, get a quick snack or use the facilities. And once I close this session, you will head back to either the lobby if you're using a desktop or the registration page um, and your event ticket if you're using your browser, and you'll be able to join the next session at 1045. So we will see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>